Hello, everybody. So let's start our chapter seven from the Wooldridge textbook, where we discuss multiple regression model qualitative regressors. I'm going to do it in two parts. And in part one, we are going to cover uh, the models that the explanatory variables, the x's, the right hand side variables, are qualitative regressors, right? So, for example, we can have gender, it can be male, female, we can have uh, race, we can have ethnicity, we can have religion, we can have uh, different categorical variables that you can think of. For example, the effect of 2020 uh, uh, on your model. So you use it as a dummy variable. So in, in the first part that uh, we will cover when X uh, or uh, the regressors are qualitative variables. And in the second part, we, we, we will look into the models that the left-hand side variable uh, your y, the dependent variable, is a dummy variable, is a, is a binary variable. So the, the application for both of them is huge. And of course, you can have a combination, you know, right? So you can have your left-hand side variable is a dummy variable, and the right-hand side variables are a combination of continuous variables and categorical variables, right? So we, we can have a, con a combination of all these things. And the application of these categorical variables in the model uh, in finance and econ is huge. I think in, in any, any kind of field, uh, it's huge. You, for example, I don't know, you want to you predict that in, in, I don't know, in the stock market, you want to say buy or sell. So what is buy or sell? Zero, one, right? On the left-hand side, your dependent variable is zero, one. Or uh, loan application, you want to see that if someone ha if has uh, if he or she has applied for a loan, the loan will get rejected or accepted, right? So zero one. So you can think of many, many applications out there when it comes to using qualitative regressors, either as a dependent variable or independent variable. Okay. So let's begin our class with going over the case uh, when the X's are qualitative regressors. Qualitative information. So let's see what are the examples. So for instance, we can what do we what do we call qualitative variable or categorical variable? Variables can be gender, race, industry, region, rate, uh, rating grades, and etc. Right. So gender can be male, female, race again, uh, white, black, etc. Industry, finance. Uh, I don't know. You, you name different kind of industries, right? And. Uh, education, finance, you know, industrials, and things like this. You, know, you can think of 11 sectors of S&P as different industries, so we can at least name 11 industries in, in US stock market. And then regions, so for instance, we are looking at 51 states, well, not 51, we're looking at 50 states of the United States, right? So we, we are going to have 50 classes for that region. Rating grades, we can have A, A minus, B plus, and et cetera, right? So these are all examples for qualitative information or categorical information. So a way to incorporate qualitative information is to use dummy variables. So we're gonna use dummy variables. And remember, what, what is a dummy variable? Dummy variable is a variable that can, it's a binary rule. We can take only two values, zero, one. And we, this dummy variables can appear both on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. So we can have them in, as a dependent variable on the left-hand side or independent variable on the right-hand side. Today, we're gonna cover the ones that show in the, the right-hand side in the independent variable. Next class, we're gonna cover the ones that show as a dependent variable or the left-hand side variable, okay? Now, let's start with some examples. And then, so in this chapter, we're gonna cover many examples because the best way to learn, uh, specifically, you know, the dummy variables in regression analysis, I, I personally believe that is through multiple examples. So I will cover five or six or even more examples from the textbook. And at each example, I'll provide to, uh, I'll do my best to provide some teaching materials at the same time, okay? So, Let's say, going back to our you know, beloved model from the fir first class, we are regressing wage on some factors, right? So, so far we used to regress wage on education, experience, age, and et cetera. Now, we wanna learn uh, to something that how can I regress a wage on some categorical variables like gender, like female. 
okay, like ethnicity, like, I don't know, you know, religion, like region, like industry. So these are all interesting categorical variables that so far in this course, we hadn't know how to deal with them. But now in this chapter seven, we are going to learn how we can deal with them and how we can interpret them and how powerful these things are, okay? Okay, in terms of terminology, uh, the textbook is using another uh, uh, another Greek letter instead of beta, the textbook is using delta. I agree with the author because you know it's a good idea to separate them from other uh, explanatory verbals. And again, this is we just define a delta to make sure that we're talking about dummy variables, right? Dummy variables or the ones has are related to dummy variables. So this doesn't mean that you know you can name it anything you want. So for instance, I can go ahead and instead of uh, my model can be something like this. Wage is a regressing wage on, sorry, let me have my setup in front of me. It's not the best setup that I have. Give me one second. All right, so I can have something like wage is equal to beta zero. This is perfectly fine. Beta one, female plus beta two, education and etc. Instead of delta, I can use delta beta one. That's totally fine, okay? But in the, I just wanna be consistent with the textbook. The author decided to use delta to make sure that, you know, delta, well, these the coefficients, the variables for these ones are dummy for the rest of them when we use beta or our uh, previous continuous random variables or discrete random variables. It's not dummy, whatever it is, it's not dummy, okay? Now, let's see what we have here. So table seven one is our data, right? So what is the data? We have a bunch of elements. So these are the observations. And for, let's say I have 526 observation in the data. And what do we have? We have wage, education, experience, female, married, and et cetera, right? So look at that. This is a dummy variable. And you know, I wanna show you something that, it's a very good name too. In, in this course, and most probably at your work, the data set is given. So you don't need to come up with good names for the, the variables in the data set. But if at any point you had to do that, be careful to pick you know, you know, smart names. So for instance, if instead of gender, if I, it, sorry, instead of female, if I wanted to pick gender, then, and so I give you something like this, zero, one, one, zero. Then how do you know that zero is male or female? Okay, we don't know. So gender is not a good name, but if I pick the name as female, I know one stay for female and zero stands for male. So this is a good name. The same story for married. So zero means unmarried, one means married. And we don't care about any other status. So for instance, we don't have widow or things like this, right? So be careful, dummy variables can only take two values, zero, one. If, and now your natural next question is, what if you know, I have a variable that can take three classes, can take four classes and things like this, right? So let's call, imagine I wanna have, you know, let's say color in the model. And my data set, there are three colors in the data set, red, let me use just the initial, well, okay, go ahead, red, Green, G, and B stands for blue, okay? Now, how can I use dummy variable? Well, the thing is that if you have K classes, so here, what's the number of K? It's three, I have K classes, right? I have three classes. Then you need K minus one dummy variable. So in this setup, I need two dummy variables to completely represent red, green, black, okay? So my dummy variable can be, I can call it D1, D2, and I define it like this. I say, okay, D1, D2. Remember, dummy variables can only take two values. So it can be zero, one. And I, I, I make this arrangement, right? I can say, if D1 is equal to one, then we're talking about red class. If D2 is equal to one, then you're talking about green class. Again, this is something that I'm making up. So there is no, right or wrong way. I just wanna say that if D1 is equal to one, then we're talking about red. If D2 is equal to one, we're talking about green. And we are claiming that I don't need to have D3. Oops. 
So this is a subtle point. I want to pay, I want you to pay attention. We don't need to have D3 and say something like this. If D3 is equal to one, then it is blue. We're going to say that, okay, instead of this, only two dummy variables is enough because D1 here is one and everywhere else is going to be zero, right? Because D1 is a dummy variable, it can only take two values, one, zero. If it is one, it's red. If it is not one, it can be either green or blue, right? The same story for D2. If D2 is one, the class is green. If it is not one, so it's zero, it can be either red or blue, right? Look at that. So I can say I am able to define three classes using two dummy variables. How? If D1 is equal to one, D2 is equal to zero, it's red. If D1 is equal to zero, D2 is equal to one, it's green. And if D1 is equal to zero, D2 is equal to zero, it's blue. You see, for three classes, I only needed two dummy variables. That's it. So this is general rule. If you have 10 classes, you need to add nine dummy variables uh, in the regression model. So if you have 12 months, you need to add 11 dummy variables in the model. If you have 50 states, you need to have uh, 49 dummy variables in the model. Okay. So that's one important thing. But now in this example, our dummy variable, we, okay, how many classes I have? So imagine we are talking about this model. How many classes I have in terms of gender, female and male? How many dummy variables I need? One. What do I call it? Female. I could have called it divan. I could have called it male. I could have called it gender. But we know that in this setup, female is a better name, right? The same story, married. So it seems that it's only zero, one. So we have two class for married. So how many dummy variables I need? Just one. So if I want to extend this model, I can say plus beta, beta or delta. You're going to say delta because you're dealing with dummy variables. Delta one and married. Married. I can extend this model like this, right? It's completely proper setup. All right. Now let's talk about the intuition of all these things. Now, when I have a dummy variable in the model, uh, how should I interpret that and uh, things like this. Okay, so how do we, what can I say about this delta zero? This delta zero that we have here. The delta zero is going to be our wage gain or loss if the person is a woman rather than a man. So what does it mean? Depending on the sign of this delta, if this the sign of delta zero is positive, so the, this model is suggesting that females on average are earning more than male, okay? If it is negative, it suggests that female on average, again, on average, we're gonna prove this on average mathematically, on average, we'll earn less number, delta zero number than male, right? So that's, that's, that's the idea. And of course, we need to say holding everything else constant. So our set of service interpretation is still there. You know, whenever you want to interpret any of any kind of coefficients in multiple regression analysis, you have to say we are holding everything else constant. Okay. And again, our female is a dummy variable. It's one if you're talking about a woman. If it is, if it's zero if you're talking about a man. Okay. Now let's go to the next slide and see what's the difference. Well, we can have. Remember. I can replace this female with, with one and write the model. I can replace it with zero and write the model. Actually, let's do it here. So if female is equal to one, then we're talking about uh, women in the data set, right? It's as if I'm filtering the women's in the data set. So what's the equation? Wage is going to be called uh, beta zero plus delta zero multiply female, which is one. So it's beta zero plus delta zero plus beta one education. Do you see that? Plus some error. Okay. So this means that it's my intercept. So the intercept for female inter, intercept for female is going to be beta zero plus delta zero. For male, it's going to be what? I just need to replace female with zero in the model. So I have beta zero plus beta one education plus you, right? So nothing is going to happen to the coefficient of education in this setup, right? And the only difference between male and female, it says, you know, at the end of the day, I have two regression lines. 
to, let's say this is for female, this is for male, or this is for male, this is for female, depending on the, the sign of delta zero. If delta zero is negative, so we say that look at the intercept. On average, at any level of education, females are earning less than male. Okay. If it is positive, on average, female at any level of education are earning more than male. So that's the idea. So at the end of the day, we can, re, you know, instead of one regression line, when you have a dummy variable with two classes, you are going to have two regression lines. If it is three classes, three regression lines. If it is 10 classes, 10 regression lines. The difference in this setup is going to be the intercept. The slope is the same. The slope is going to be beta 1 in this example, and the intercept is going to be different. So let's go over the next slide. So this is what I was talking about, right? So the first one, we were talking about men. And the reason that this line is above the other line, above this line, is that delta 0 in the data, we're going to see that delta 0 is negative. It is, it is unfortunate and it is sad, but uh, I think for the past 100 years of data, when you look at the data, there is still, even, you know, guys, it's 2020, still in 2020, there is wage discrimination against gender. Okay, so this is important. So it means that if you throw real data to this regression, your delta zero is going to be negative, and unfortunately, it is statistically significant. I guess it is upon our generation to make sure that, you know, if people are learning econometrics in the next 10 years, they're going to work with 2020 data, this, this delta zero should not be significant, right? It should, should be insignificant. It means that it shouldn't be, we should reject the idea that it is equal to zero. We fail to reject the idea that it is equal to zero, okay? Oh, let's, no, let's hold our fingers crossed for the next, I don't know, 10 years. But again, this is upon our generation to make sure that going forward, you know, some some dummy variables like gender, like race, like religion, these dummy variables should not turn out to be significant in the data going forward. But as of today, unfortunately, all of them are significant. You know, blacks on average earn less than whites, female on average earn less than male, and etc. Okay. So the reason, again, the reason that the line for men is above the line for women is that this delta in the data is going to be, delta zero is going to be negative, okay? Now, look at the difference. I, I derived the equation for you on the previous slide. So the slope, the intercept for female is going to be beta zero plus delta zero. The intercept for male is going to be beta zero. And because delta zero is less than zero, so on average, we're going to say that females will earn less than male at any level of education. Look at that. If education is this, that's the difference. If education is this, that's the difference, right? So if you believe that, regardless of the level of education, males are going to earn on average more than female, then this is a good tip. But if for whatever reason you believe that this, this, you know, this is not a good idea, you think that maybe that's the case when the education is, uh, is let's say zero for both of them, so you're both uneducated, but you think that, again, this is your idea. You think that if this is the regression line for female, maybe this is a regression line for male, or maybe they, should, they don't need to cross out each other. Maybe this is for female and this is for male. Okay, does that make sense? So if, if you believe that this is the idea, that yes, females are going to, when the education is zero, when both female and male are uneducated, maybe males on average earn more, but as the education increased, and this is the case, you know, as of today, you know, we, are, we see that, you know, when we, when we go for more educated people, people, the, the salary between male and female is getting smaller and smaller, right? So as education increased, this happens. But how can I add something as beautiful as this to the model? How can I say that the uh, the effect of education should be, uh, marginal effect of education should depend on gender as well. So I'll leave it as a question mark. We'll get back to that. But if you have listened to our previous class, when we talked about chapter six, marginal effect of one variable depends on other variable, does that ring a bell? So what should I use? Interaction term, right? So if you believe that this is the idea, as education increased, the wage discrimination between male and female should also decrease. 
and, uh, and also data to support this idea. Then we have to add the interaction term between education and gender. So we call gender here female. So if I add something like this to the model, it's going to beautifully capture this idea. But right now, you're going to say that right now, let's say our model does not have that beautiful interaction term. This is the model. Okay. This is the model. There's no interaction. There's female, there's education. If I take derivative with respect to education, it's going to be beta one. So the marginal effect of education on wage is going to be constant. Look at that. The marginal effect of education on wage is going to be constant. It's beta one, regardless if you're male or female, beta one, okay? But we know that, at least we hope that in the real data, this is not the case. And something like this should be the case. Well, ideally, we don't like any of them. We want to see if delta zero is not significant at all. There is no wage discrimination, okay? okay. Now, in terms of interpretation, we can say delta zero is, look at that. On, if I look at the conditional expectation, what's the expected value of wage given uh, female is equal to one and at any level of education. So let's say we fix the education, I don't know, maybe 18 or 16 years college education. We're gonna say that So this point is going to be the expected value of wage given female is equal to zero and education is equal to 16, right? Minus this, minus this one, which is expected value of wage given female is equal to one and education is equal to 16. This is my delta zero. Okay. So the delta zero is a change in intercept. Okay, remember this phrase: change in intercept. So if you only have one dummy variable in the model without the interaction term, you are allowing for shift in intercept. The slope is the same. Again, there is shift in intercept. The slope is the same. We can show this. You no, know, so we call it intercept shift, right? We can show this on the next slide mathematically. Okay. Uh, well. I don't have it on the next slide, but I just uh, I proved it on, on this whiteboard for you. So you just simply need to plug, if, it, if you go back here, just plug for female one or zero and write down the equation. So you see that the only difference between the two models is the intercept, but the slope is the same. So this model allows for intercept shift. Now, let's look at uh, some variation of dummy variable. So there's something called dummy variable trap. And in general, dummy variable trap is like this. If I have K classes, so if I have K classes, I know that, so K classes. For K classes, I need to have K minus one dummies. If, if instead of K minus one, if I use K classes, K dummies, then we call it dummy variable trap. What's going on here? Let's go this slide so here let's say we have gender gender has two classes male and female and for whatever reason this is mr specification by the way for whatever reason i put both male class one and female class two in the model so this is a wrong setup right this model cannot be estimated because of perfect collinearity why do i have perfect collinearity because if observation number one is male then I know for a fact female is going to be zero. So there's perfect relationship between the two. If observation number one is female, zero, then I know for a fact that female is going to be one, right? So I don't need to have both of them in the model. So I just need to put one of them. And if I, by accident, put both of them in the model, in theory, we have perfect collinearity is violation of assumption number three. In practice, R is going to drop one of them for you, okay? R automatically drop them. I think it's theta, you will get an error in Python, also is going to be automatically dropped. Okay, so when using dummy variables, one category has always need to be dropped or omitted. Okay, we call that category that it's dropped, we call it base. 
or benchmark group? Base group or benchmark group? So you look at the model. And so let's look at model number one. We have two classes, male and female. If in the model, uh, you see one of them is missing, that's the benchmark. So in model number one, what's the benchmark? Male, because I'm seeing female. In model number two, what's the benchmark or base group? Female, okay? So why do we call it base, base or benchmark? Because we're going to say that delta zero tells me on average how much more or less females are earning, uh, so we say on average, Females are earning, let's say, delta zero number more or less than male, than male. So then that something is your benchmark. Because in whenever we have dummy variables, we are always comparing something to a benchmark group, to a base group. And that base group is going to be omitted from the classes, right? So if I have three classes, actually, we're going to look at, I don't know, let's go back to our green, black, blue, no, blue is not a good one. Green, black, red class, right? So for this one, I need to have three dummy variables, right? So let's let's do this. Y is equal to beta zero plus delta zero. I just named dummy variable G. G stands for green. If it is one, it's green. If it is zero, it's anything, anything else but green, right? Plus delta one B. Again, B stands for blue. And if it is uh, it's one, it's blue. If it is one, it's blue. If it is zero, it's not blue, right? And then I stop here. I don't need to add delta to R, right? This is extra. So I just, uh, I just erase it from the model and then say some unobserved factors. This one, which is dropped from the model, so class R is my base group or benchmark group. What does it mean? It means that, so when I look at delta zero, it says that on average, Greens are, I don't know, earning, if it is to wage, earning more, uh, delta zero more or less than red. Blue, on average, is earning delta one more or less than red. So we are comparing things to the one that we're dropping from the model. Okay, so this is a definition of a base group. So we're going to see again, as I said before, we're going to see five, six examples from the textbook, and all these things will make sense when we, when we put it together. Okay, our example number one, let's see, let's start with the one that there is a huge literature. So if you just search for wage discrimination papers in economics, you know, the literature is bottomless. You know, you'll see thousands of papers read, written and starts from, I don't know, maybe whenever the data was available from 19th century to, to even today, 2020, there, unfortunately, there has been wage discrimination but the magnitude is changing, right? So let's say this is the model. I have a model and in this model, I'm not controlling for any factor, okay? I'm not controlling for any other factor than gender. So I know that the wage depends on education, depends on experience, depends on, I don't know, the location, industry, and you name it, right? But I will start, I just wanna say purely, what if I only put the female in the model? Okay, I want to see what is the biggest difference between male and female on average. And then you're going to talk about it is does that make sense or not? Should you rely on that number or not? But let's say I have data, I have wage, I have gender. So 10, 1, these are hourly wages 15, 0, 21, 21, 0, 16, and etc. Right? So I have a data set. I can easily run a regression. Let's say this is the output for the regression. So wage hat is going to be 7.10 and minus 2.51 female. So both of them are super significant. So the intercept and the slope are super significant. But for now, let's say, uh, let's see how we can interpret these numbers. In terms of significance, both of them are significant, both the intercept beta zero and our delta zero. And by the way, here we call it delta zero, right? I could have called it beta one, so don't get confused. This is just a name. So number of observation 526, R square 11.6%, not that good, not bad either, okay? So how we interpret this number? 
again, your job is to interpret, interpret, interpret. So what can I say about this minus 2.51? And imagine these are wages or hourly wages. So I have to say, on average, this is important. For your midterm two, I need to see this on average. Uh, sorry, this is midterm three, final exam. I need to see this on average uh, on your paper in the short answer questions, because if I don't see on average, I, it's, it's telling me that you didn't get the idea of what's happening. On average, females are earning $2.5 less than, than the benchmark group. What is the benchmark group or base group than, than male? So this regression is suggesting that females are learning $2.51 less than male on average, okay, in terms of hourly wages. And here, you're not controlling for anything. So I cannot say that holding everything else constant or holding education and other things constant explicitly. I'm not controlling for anything. So not controlling for any other factor, females are learning $2.5 per hour less than male on average. The difference between the mean wage of uh, men and that of uh, women is 2.55. Okay, so let's answer some interesting question. Let's start with this one. So look at that. Our delta zero is clearly significant, right? So how do I know that it is clearly significant? I quickly calculate the t-stat, which is minus 2.51 divided by 0 0.26. It's in the order of eight or nine. It's super big. So it's okay, we are happy. Well, mm, happy is relative, right? <laughs> because I'm rejecting the null, but again, in reality, this is a sad story that you see on average, female are earning this amount of dollar less than male per hour, and it is significant. It is sadly significant, right? So this smiley face is relative. <laughs> it doesn't make sense here. I hope you get the idea, okay? But let's go back to our discussion. Going back to our discussion, it says that, okay, delta zero is clearly significant, but does that mean that the women are discriminated against? Wait a minute. So I have a, I have a regression model, and in the model, the data is suggesting that yes, it is significant, and that number is small. The answer is no, don't jump into conclusion, because you're not controlling for anything. If you control for education, control for uh, experience, control for location, control for industry, maybe, maybe, yes, still females are earning less, but the diff, no, maybe the magnitude is not that big. It's not $2.5 per hour, okay? So that's the idea. So the answer is not necessarily. Being female may be correlated with some other productivity characteristic, which of course is, that have not been controlled for in the model. So we have omitted variable bias, right? The omitted variable bias is clear here, okay? So again, we can be hopeful that maybe if I control for other exponential variables, the effect, hopefully it's not significant. And if it is significant, it's smaller than that. So this is a very important observation. Okay, now let's answer some of the other questions. What is the average wage for women and men in this example. Okay, so if I'm, so this is some algebraic property. If I'm regressing wage on a constant and a dummy variable, basically what I'm doing is, so let's go ahead and replace that female uh, with one. So what did I get? Wage half is equal to 7.10 minus 2.51 and female is one. Right, so this is 5.4 or something, is it? I can do the math, you know. Yeah, 5.49, so let me quickly borrow my calculator. So what are we doing? You're saying 7.1 minus 2.51, so it's 4. Point... Oh, sorry, my bad. Uh, seems like my brain is tired. But anyways, so it's 4.59 right dollar so this is the if, if there is no any other exponential variable variable in the model i can say this is the average wage for female average wage for female or for women in the data so the average wage for women in the data is going to be 4.59 what is the average wage for men so i just need to replace this with zero so the average wage is going to be 7.1 
And this is the case only there is no any other explanatory variable in the model. Because if, if I had education in the model, then that's not the average. Uh, that's not the average wage for men. That's the average wage for men only if education is equal to zero or only if tenure is equal to zero. Does that make sense? Okay, so here that's correct because there is no any other explanatory rule in the model. Okay, now the second one. The wage difference between men and women is larger if no other things are controlled for. So if we're talking about it here, right? We're not controlling for anything and we believe that this, the this number is big, i.e. part of the difference is due to the difference in education, experience, and tenure between men and women. So the idea is that if I control for all those other explanatory variables, hopefully this number is going to get smaller and smaller. Again, ideally we believe that, we hope that it becomes insignificant, but again, as of 2020, we are going to see that it is significant, but the magnitude is smaller. And finally, it can easily be tested whether difference in means is significant or not. So did you see that how, uh, how we could say, what is the average wage for men is 7.10, and average wage for female is 7.10 minus 2.51 in this setup? So it's a general rule. Generally, simple regression on a constant and a dummy variable is a straightforward way to compare the means of two groups, right? So this is, a, Again, only if you don't have any other controlling variable in the model, okay? If you wanna see females are earning more or less, you can run a regression on of wage on a constant, beta zero, and let's say gender or male or female, whatever. If you wanna see if, if, is there any meaningful difference between average GPA of male and female, you can do, okay, let's regress GPA on a constant and let's say male and et cetera. So this is, this is one way to compare the averages. So in a statistic, if you remember from your business staff class, there are many different ways to compare the averages, but when we have econometric tools, we can do it easier. We can just run a regression on a constant and a dummy variable. So this is a very powerful technique. Anyways, so now let's go ahead and fix this. Instead of not controlling for any other factors, let's go ahead and control for education, experience, and tenure. You can, you can extend the list as long as the data support, you know, you have data for that, right? But even for this, let's see what will happen. Look at that. Now look at the numbers. So this, this turns to be negative, the intercept, to, so we don't care about the interpretation of this one in per se, because I have many other exponential variables in the model, right? Education is positive, not surprising. Experience positive, tenure positive. Female is still negative, but look at the magnitude. It used to be $2.5, now it's only $1.8, okay? Is it significant? Unfortunately and sadly, yes, because 1.8 divided by 0.3-ish, it's more than six. So it is still significant. It's bad news, but the good news is that look at the magnitude, it's less than uh, 2.5. Now, delta zero is still clearly significant. Does that mean that women are discriminated against now? The answer is still, we are not sure. So we need to control for more exponential variables. And let's say you control for 10 of them, 20 of them, and it is still significant, but the magnitude is smaller. You say that, yes, now I can say, it seems that there is a causal relationship between being female and your wage. Okay, but honestly, you know, in theory, we never know the answer to this question. We never know. Because we don't know how many, controlling for how many exponential variables is enough. And sometimes you don't have data, right? So imagine you think that talent is a good variable, but you don't have talent. You may want, you might go ahead and use IQ as a proxy, but what if there are some variables that there is no good proxy for them either? So we're gonna say, okay, you make some statements. Controlling for these things, yes, it seems that women are discriminated against. All right, now let's look at a bunch of other examples. So another example, we want to see what is the effect of having computer on college GPA, okay? Imagine this is the model. I'm regressing college GPA on PC. It's a good name for dummy variable. So if PC is equal to one, what do you expect to see? 
Well, what, how do you interpret that? It means that you own a PC. If it is equal to zero, you don't own a PC, right? So PC is a good name, right? Then high school GPA, ACT, and et cetera, right? So because there's, a, at least in the terminology of the textbook, because it's delta, I know that it's, we are talking about the dominant variable. All right, so let's throw the data at this uh, regression and look at the numbers. So the numbers are, this one is significant, this one is significant. Again, I'm quickly dividing 0, uh, 0.157 to 0, uh, 0.057. It's greater than, as long as it's greater than 2.5 or 3, it's easily significant. So significant, significant, this is also significant. This, this is insignificant. The ACT score is not significant, right? Now, let's answer a bunch of interesting questions. You know, our score is 21.9%. Okay, so what are the questions? First one. And guys, you can think of these questions as a short answer questions on the exam for final, okay, for on the final exam or multiple choice questions. So the slides that we have for this chapter, I, at the end of each slide, I ask a bunch of questions. You know, you can treat them as a you know, sample exam exercise. Who is the treatment group or bench? You know, okay, there is a new terminology here. Treatment group versus control group, right? So we want to see who is the treatment group, who is the uh, something we call control group. Okay, so the treatment group are the ones that we are treating. We are doing something to them, right? We are starting them. So the treatment group here is when PC is equal to one. Okay, PC owners. These are the treatment groups, and control group are the ones who don't have PC. So we control for them. What was the other name for that? This is was our base group or benchmark group. Benchmark. Remember, the one that's not in the model. So do you see no PC in the model? No. You just see PC in the model. Okay. So this means that, so uh, how, let me see if I have interpretation. Well, let me ask you a question. So how can I interpret this number? I say that. Uh, for college students, the one who owns PC will have a higher college GPA in, in the magnitude of 0 0.157 on average compared to the benchmark. What is the benchmark? The ones who don't have PCA, not PCA, PC, right? Holding everything else constant, holding high school GPA, ACT score constant. So this is how you should interpret that. Be careful about the term on average, be careful about the term holding everything else constant, and be careful about uh, that reference point. You know, they, they, their GPA, college GPA is going to be zero, 0.157 higher than what? Than the benchmark group. And the benchmark group is the one who don't have PC. Okay. So these are all very important points that you should emphasize when you're interpreting this thing. Okay, so we, we're done this. Let's do the second one. What is the T-stat for PC? How do you interpret that one? So we interpret this number already. What's the T-stat for PC? So T-stat for PC is going to be 0 0.57 divided by 0 0.057. This is a big number. It's going to be around 2.5. So if you do the math, you get 2.75. Again, this is a big number, so it's just significant. I can say at least at one, it is significant at 1%. Okay, I put three stars on top of it. Okay, what if you drop ACT? Okay, let's look at ACT. Is ACT itself significant? So T stands for ACT is 0 0.0087 divided by 0 0.01. It's clearly less than one, so it's not significant. Okay, now should I go ahead and drop something which is not significant from the model? So remember wage, and not wage, call it GPA, PC, high school GPA, ACT, okay? It seems that ACT is not super significant here. So maybe this is not a good setup. Maybe this is a good setup. It's not significant that much, okay? So should I drop it from the model? Okay, no, there is no clear answer. So you can go ahead and drop it from the model and look at the adjusted R score. If adjusted R score increased, yes, go ahead and drop it from the model. But if the adjusted R score decreased, then you want to want to say mm, maybe ACT collectively with some other variables are jointly significant. Yes, it's not individually significant, but maybe they're jointly significant. So you can, but here it doesn't make sense to maybe 
ACT and high school GPA, you want to test that if your joint was dipping it significant or not. But I want you to stick to that adjusted R square. If the adjusted R square is obviously shrinking a lot when you drop it, then you should not drop it. Okay, but if the adjusted R score increase, you should drop it. And uh, because remember, if I drop something that it is correlated with other variables, and uh, maybe I'm dealing with some uh, omitted variable bias as well, so we have to be careful. So the answer for this one, you know, here it seems that it's okay because you know the ACT, you know, the coefficient for ACT is not significant, right? However, you have to look at the adjusted R score and then make a call. What about high school GPA? This is a big deal because high school GPA is significant. So if I drop something that is significant, it's guaranteed that I'm going to deal with omitted variable bias, okay? Because I'm deleting something which is relevant. So deleting something which is relevant is, bring, is going to bring omitted variable bias for the other coefficient. It's going to make the other coefficients bias. So the answer to this one is, yeah, but make some argument to this one, no, you have a strong argument. What if we use no PC instead of PC? So this is for your homework. So there's a question on homework and this is exactly, well, actually, let me help you out. Yeah. But I expect you to do this for your homework. So it's, it's basically telling you that, what if instead of PC, we use no PC? So what will happen to this equation? Well, actually, let's see what will happen to the estimated numbers. Think about it. So first of all, what's the relationship between PC and no PC? So PC plus no PC, it's going to be always equal to one, right? Because if PC is one, no PC is zero. If PC is zero, no PC is one. So it's going to be all equal to one. So it means that my PC is going to be equal to one minus no PC. So I can go ahead and wherever I have PC in the model, replace it with one minus no PC and see what will happen, okay? But before doing that, I want you to use your intuition. Use your intuition and think about it. So go back to, the, to this equation. If I want to replace PC with no PC, what will happen to the coefficient of high school GPA? Nothing. What will happen to co coefficient of ACT score? Nothing, right? Because you know, I'm changing PC to no PC. Why is something you change to them? What will happen to this coefficient, the coefficient of PC, now that I have no PC? Now go over the intuition. So if the PC owners will earn uh, 0.157 more GPA than the no PC earners, so if I want to change PC to no PC, what will happen to plus uh, 0.157? It's going to be turned negative, right? So because I, then I will say that the no PC, the ones who don't own PC will, their GPA is going to be 0.157 less than the PC owners. So intuitively I can get that. And what will happen to intercept? This must definitely change because, okay, remember we are doing this manipulation to the data. So let's do that, call it GPA. I just call it GPA. Well, we have high school GPA too, so let's call it GPAs. 1.26 plus 157. Now, instead of PC, I have one minus no PC. Plus the rest of it, right? So look at that, the rest of it, nothing is going to happen to the rest of it. But here, what's going on? 1.26 plus 0.157 minus 0.157 and everything else. Look at that. The intercept change, it went up from 1.26 to this number. So what do we have? 1.26 plus 0.157. So it's going to be 1.417 minus 0.157, no PC and everything else. So that's the answer, right? You already guessed that this should be the mirror of this number, right? Because if PC owners get this number higher, no PC owners will get this number lower, okay, than the benchmark. And this also changed because we need to have that, and we see why it changes, it changes because you know, we are doing something like this. And intuitively, when you think about it, you know, we are, we have two lines, right? We are going from one line to the other line. 
What will happen to the intercept? Intercept is going to change. Okay. All right. So now let's look at another example. So we are saying that again, I'm teaching you some materials from the textbook within examples by using examples, right? So we are incorporating ordinal information using dummy variables. Now let's say your random variable is an ordinal variable like credit rating and credit rating can take you know, five different values. So in this case, you know, it starts from zero to four. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. So zero, one, two, three, four. Sorry, there's no five. So how many classes I have? Five. Now, this suggests that it's, this is an ordinal variable. What does ordinal mean? Ordinal means that, so if your credit rating is three, it doesn't mean that it is three times better than one. If your credit rating is four, it doesn't mean that it's four times better than one or two times better than two. It's ordinal. It just say that, okay, four is better than two, but it's not twice. Three is better than one, but it's not three times, okay? So this is an ordinal variable. So for ordinal variable, if I set up the model like this, this is a wrong setup. Why? Because let's read the regression once. We are regressing MBR. This is municipal bond rate on, so let me give you a second. We are regressing municipal bond rates on you know, credit rating and some other factors. And if, so imagine this number is some, I don't know, negative number because you know the bond rate is going to be negatively related to the credit rating. The better credit rating, the lower the interest rate for the bond rate, right? So let's say this number is minus 0.05. Again, this is not for US because 5% is huge, but let's just for simplicity, let's say this is the idea. It says that if your credit rating go from one to two, then the interest rate is going to decrease on average by 5%. Is this the right setup? The answer is absolutely no, because we cannot say that this is not the, this the, the ordering. Going from one to two does not double your credit. Going from one to three does not triple your credit, and etc. Because we have five different classes: zero, one, two, three, four. The correct right to put this in the model is to come up with four uh, dummy variables. Now, if I have four dummy variables in the model, look at that. So I can have CR1, CR2, CR3, CR4. So how, how do I define them? CR1 is equal to one if your rating is one. CR2 is equal to one if your rating is uh, one. Sorry. CR2 is equal to one if your rating is two and etc. CR3 is equal to one if your rating is three and this if your rating is four. So by looking at this regression, what's the benchmark? What's the base group? the one which is not in the model. Which one is not in the model? CR0. So we are saying that we are comparing all these classes with respect to what? With respect to base group. What's the base group? You know, uh, credit is equal to zero, the worst credit, okay? So these are dummies indicating whether the particular rating applies. For example, CR1 is equal to one and et cetera all effects are measured in comparison to our base group which is the worst rating which is cr is equal to zero okay so this was another example i just wanted to realize that when you have an ordinary variable you have to make sure that you need to add k minus one type dummy variable for k class of ordinary information or ordinal information not ordinary ordinal information all right let's look at another example Let's say, let's say now we on the left hand side, it's a log model. Okay, so we have log level model using dummy exponential variables in equations for log y percentage interpretation. Okay, again, this, it should be not, there should be nothing new here. You already know how to interpret log level model, but now that we're adding dummy variables, so let's, let's go that further step and see what will happen. So we're looking at, we want to see what's the effect of this style of a house on the price. And we know that in US, colonial houses are, are, are in demand. 
you know, historically, if, if the house is colonial, there's going to be a positive effect on the price of house, right? At least in the US, that's the case. For, for, for US people's taste, that's, that's the idea. Let's regress log price on log lot size, log square feet, number of bedrooms, and colonial. Okay. And if we throw data at this model, these are the answers. So the one that I'm interested in is this one. Number of observation 88, R square 65%. It's huge, it's good. So let's interpret these numbers. So how can I interpret this 0 0.054? Remember, with respect to colonial, this is a log level model. So it says that if the house is colonial, on average, a colonial style house, the price is going to be 5.4% higher than the base bench group. What is the benchmark group or base group? Non-colonial houses, right? Holding everything else constant. Okay, so you have to make sure that you you refer and you 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 mention every single of these uh, nuances in the definition uh, uh, or in the interpretation of this number, right? So let me do it one more time. The colonial style houses, on average, the price is 5.4 percent higher than non-colonial houses in parentheses, the base group, if holding everything else constant. Lot, lot size, lot square feet, number of bedroom constant. Okay, so that's that's another example. And mathematically, remember we have seen this before. Delta lot price divided by delta uh, colonial. We are basically looking at the marginal effect of a colonial style house on lot price. So this means that we can roughly say this is percentage change in price, and we say okay, this number multiplied by hundred, and then interpret that. 5.4%. So as a dummy for colonial style change from zero to one, so it means that you're talking about colonial style, the house price increased by 5.4% on average, holding everything else constant. Okay, make sure that you write this on the average one. All right, let's look at yet another example. Again, I will do these examples uh, uh, until I, I feel that, okay, we have enough examples that you can, you know, you can do the interpretation correctly and you're teaching something, you know, for each example, there is some new teaching materials attached. Okay, now let's look at another one. Let's go back to our mm, interesting wage versus gender education experience and tenure, right? So this is a, this is a model that I expect you come up with a model like this for your final project. You know, yeah, I have everything in this model. You know, on the left-hand side, it's log, so it means that it controls for heteroskedasticity problems. This, this is log transformation. On the right-hand side, I have a dummy variable. I have a quadratic version for experience, quadratic version to tenure. And maybe you can do it a little more advanced and put an interaction term between gender, female, and let's say education as well. This is something that you're going to do in the next slide. But for now, let's say this is our model. If this is the model, then let's see how we can interpret the numbers. So again, quickly take a look. Significant, 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 significant. This is barely spot significant. It's two point something, but it's still. So all of the coefficients are significant. Our score is 44%, which is not that bad. I, for this one, when I have, one, two, three, four, five, six exponential variables. I, I really want to see the adjusted R square. Okay, so you have to, uh, you can calculate the adjusted R square, by the way. So you can use that equation, one minus one minus R square, and n minus one, and minus k minus one. So you can, you have everything, right? So you have R square, dot, you have n, dot, you have k, one, two, three, four, five, six, six. You can calculate the R square. It's going to be some number, of course, less than 44%, right? Because remember, the adjusted R square is going to be always less than R square. Okay, so what else can I say from this regression? So let's answer the question. What does the coefficient of female mean? Coefficient of female is minus 0297. Whenever I ask you something like this, so basically we are dealing with, so what's the partial effect of female? So when I, what's the coefficient of female? That's the partial effect of female on wage. 
So whenever you have something like this, remember in multiple regression analysis, I want you to take derivatives. So if you want to see what's the coefficient of female, what does that mean? So you have to make sure that you take derivative with respect to female. So take derivative of log weight with respect to female. So what do I have? Minus 297. Do I see female anywhere else? Well, in this example, no. So we stop here. Okay. So this means that, uh, so this suggests that females on average will earn this number multiply 100. So it's 29.7% less than the benchmark, which is male. So why do I say 29.7%? Because remember, this is log level. Okay. So we are connecting all these things that we've learned so far. So again, this chapter is basically putting everything together. So this is how I interpret that. The coefficient of the female implies that for the same level of education, experience, and tenure, that's basically holding everything else constant. Women's earn about 29.7% less than men and on average. Please write that on average. All right. Okay, what else? Now, let me, now let's talk about, so for the rest of this slide, so we're already slide 10. So for the rest of this slide, we are going to make a new challenge for ourselves. So we're going to say that, what if you want to add a new dummy variable marriage to the model? Okay. So what if I want to add, I want to see what's the effect of marriage to the model as well. So basically, I want to add this marriage as a dummy. Let's call it delta one dummy. But I, I'm also interested to see what's the interaction between marriage and gender. So basically, I want to talk about four different classes. Married male, married female, single male, single female. So I want to make sure that my model is controlling for these four different classes, right? So there are two ways to incorporate these four classes in the model. You know, the one that you may think is that, okay, I have four classes, so let's add three dummy variables to the models, and the dummy variables are going to be male, married male, married female, single female, single male. So if I have this three dummy variables in the model, it means that what's the benchmark? Single female. So this is one way. You can say, you know what? I want to do married male, single male, single female. So if I add these things to the model, what is the benchmark? The one that's dropping, married female. So one way is like this. So you say that, okay, you know, manually construct all the interaction between your two dummy variables. So I have two dummy variables, each of them have two classes. So two by two is four classes, right? Then pick K minus one dummy variable for them. So here we have four classes. So K minus one is three, three class. So I'm gonna add three dummy variables to the model. So this is one way. There is another neat way to do all these things that I'm gonna talk about it later uh, by the end of this, chat, uh, this uh, class. But for now, have in mind that what we wanna do is to see what's the interaction between both marriage and gender in a regression. So let's do that in the first way that I just explained. So let's do it this way. We are gonna say that, okay. Uh, we're going to use dummy variable for multiple ca categories. So define membership in each category by a dummy variable and leave out one category, which becomes base, base group. So let's say we can do something like this. Married male, MM. Married female, MF. Single female, SF. Plus education, experience, experiences, we're a tenure, tenure. School. So we're not touching the rest of the regression, right? So the rest of the regression is the same. So if I go back to the previous slide, so we have education, experience, experience square, tenure, and tenure square. So the rest of the uh, regressions are going to be the same. So let's erase that. Mm, let me erase this part. All right. So if I set up the model like this, what is the benchmark group? So I have married male, married female, single female. So the benchmark is going to be single male. So this means that if I want to interpret these numbers, it's going to be compared to single male, compared to single male, compared to single male, compared to single male. Now let's interpret all of them 
Uh, again, I'm going to repeat all this interpretation until you feel comfortable. So let's interpret this one. This one means that holding everything else constant, education, experience, and tenure, then married male is going to earn 21.3% because this is a lot. 21.3% more than what? Than benchmark, than single male. Let's do the other one. Married female on average, holding everything else constant are going to, again, married female are going to earn 19.8% less than single male. Okay, now let's look at the last one. Single female on average, holding everything else constant are going to earn 11% less than single male, the one that you're benchmarking, okay, you're basing. So again, I wrote one of them here for you, but you can think of the other ones as well. So holding other things fixed, married males, so married women here. Uh, on app, sorry, married women, yes, married female, MF. On average, earns this number 19.8% less than my base group, which is single male. Okay. So this is how we interpret that. So interpret the dominant coefficients. Difference between single and married uh, woman. And so let's answer some questions. It says that what's the difference between single and married woman? So single female and married female, married female. So if I want to see what's the difference between single female and married female, so do I have single female here? Yes. The coefficient is 11%. Okay, single female. Because remember, the benchmark was single male. Do I have uh, married women here or married female? Yes, I have. So what's the number? 19.8. So these are, so what, what I know so far, I know that single female is earning 11% than single male. This is one state. I also know that married female is earning 19.8% less than single male. So if I'm comparing them relative to one base group, so what, what does it mean? It means that single female, look at that, single female is earning the difference, what's the difference? 8.8, 8.8% more than married female. Do you see that? This is important because look at that. Single female earns 11% less than uh, single male. Married female earns 19.8% less. So this married females are earning even less than single females. So this means that single females are earning 8.8% more than married female. Or married females are earning 8.8% less than single female. So we can answer questions like this as well. Now let's answer another question. Is the difference between, uh, so we are, we are asking some significance question. We ask, is the difference between single and married uh, female? So single female and married female is statistically significant. Okay. So this is a very, very tricky question. I want you to pay, you know, 100% attention, you know, focus here, what's going on. I am asking if the difference between single female and married female, if the difference between these two is significant or not. So do I have single female in the model? Yes. So let's call the coefficients of, so let's, let's give them some proper name. So what I have, I have delta zero, delta one, delta two. Why am I using delta? Because these are dummies, right? And then the rest is beta one, beta two, and et cetera, right? So basically I'm asking, the null hypothesis is, if the difference between single female, delta two, minus what? Single married female, delta one, is equal to zero. So this is my null hypothesis, right? Do you remember how we treat this null hypothesis? So we use that theta transformation trick or from chapter, so now we know the materials in chapter, what is it, chapter six, we can use linear hypothesis test, right? So I can use my linear hypothesis function from R, pass the regression, and then write my null hypothesis here, delta two, so it is, single, you get the idea, single female minus delta one, delta one is married female equal to zero. So if I run this line of code in R, 
I look at the F statistic. If the p-value is less than 1%, I reject the idea. So I can answer basically this question like this, right? Is there any other easier way to answer this question? The answer is yes. So look at that. And guys, you know, pay very good. This is all of, all these things that I'm doing here. These are questions from homework. So I'm literally answering all the homework questions. So pay very good attention to what we're doing here. And uh, it says that is the difference between single female and married female is significant. Do you, do you agree that if I pick one of them as the benchmark group, as the base group, then I can simply look at the T stat of the other one, right? So nothing can stop me for deciding which one can I pick as a base group. So again, remember, I have married male, married female, single female, and single male, okay? In this model, I decided to pick these three as dummy variables and this one as a benchmark. I can come up with another setup that, so, Let's say I'm interested in, let's say married female. Yeah. Let's say this one, I'm going to, instead of, uh, I'm going to pick this MF as my benchmark. So it means that I'm going to drop MF from the model and then write the model in terms of MM, SF, SM, right? And so again, we are dropping MF. So MF is going to be our base group. So let's do that. So if you run that regression, I get something like this. Look at that, 0.41% MM, 0.98% SM, 0.088 or 8.8% SF. The rest of it is, I just put dot, 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 because nothing is going to change. And the rest of the regression is going to be unchanged because it has nothing to do with the interaction terms, right? Now, look at that. What's the question is asking? Is the difference between single female and married female significant? So do I have single female in the model? Yes. Do I have married female in the model? No. Good news. So it means that already this coefficient is relative to married female, my base group. Now I can simply look at the T stats for this one. T stat is what? 0 0.8088 divided by 0 0.052. Well, it seems to me that it's less than two, so it's not significant. Do you see? Again, either way, you should get the same answer. This is a very interesting observation. I want you to spend some time and try to write these models in with different uh, uh, benchmarks uh, or base groups you have in mind. And let's have a very fun experience here. Let's see if we can back out this number without running regression. So let's say I give you this, and I write a model like this, log wage, uh, some constant, again, we don't care, some constant plus delta zero married male plus et cetera. And I ask you, what is delta hat zero? Again, you are not allowed to use R, you are not, you don't have the signal hat, uh, signal zero hat uh, directly, but the only thing you have is something like this. Can you back out that number for me? The answer is yes. So let's, again, let's have this fun experience. We are going to say that, what is the base group here? The base group on the right-hand side is going to be single male because it's not in the model. What's the base group on the left-hand side? It's going to be married female, okay? Now, what are we looking for? We are looking for this delta zero. Delta zero is the coefficient of married male. So we are, we, are say, we are asking this question, how much more or less this married male is earning compared to married female? Again, how much this married male is getting compared to married female? Do I have married male and married female on the right-hand side? Yes, married male, 21.3%. Married female, is it married female? Yes, married male, married female, 19.8%. So if I want to say that married male, again, look at the question that I have, this one. I want to see if married male is, what's this number that married male is earning more than married female, right? This is the base group. So I know that married male is earning 21.3% more than single male. 
married female is earning 19.8% less than single male. So what's the difference between these two? The summation, 21.3% plus 19.8%. Guess what? What's this number? 41.1%. This is my 41.1%. So you should be able to go back and forth between these dummy variables. Again, I highly encourage you to do this practice. And now you can use R, so you have the codes in R, so uh, the template I provide the R code, and you can see the answers. But before looking at the answers, I encourage you to back out those numbers. So this is a very good exercise. And in your homework, you have to do it anyways. So, okay. So this was one way. So why we did something like this? Because originally I was interested to add the interaction between female, and marriage in the model. So the one way was to look into all different categories and then pick K minus one of those categories as dummy variables and be done. There is another neat version to do that. And that neat version is using the interaction term. So I can say, so, okay. So let's stop here. And this will be the topic for our next class. So in our next class, we will see the, how to answer the same questions using uh, uh, interactions with dummy variables. See you then.